again, it's a pleasure to be with you all here to uh, have this time of study and uh, call to uh, defend the unborn. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 8 with me. Psalm number 8 this morning. And the topic that I was given to preach on this morning was the image of God and the plight of the preborn. And of course, this is a very uh, fundamental um, doctrine that we as abolitionists ought to understand the image of God. And so that's what we're looking at this morning. First thing is the image of God in the preborn. And so if you have your Bibles in Psalm 8, if you'd like to stand with me for the reading of God's word, we'll read the whole psalm together. The scripture says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who hast set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer together. Our God, your name is excellent. Your name is above all the earth. And Lord, we worship that name. We praise that name. Lord, we thank you as we sang a moment ago how you have made us, how you framed us, Lord, that you gave us your purpose and calling, Lord, that you made us in your image. And Lord, thus we have dignity and worth. Lord, we pray that this morning we would uh, be found to the honor of your name. And Lord, we pray that you would open the word to us. Lord, we ask that these messages that will be spoken today will be used by many. Lord, we ask that those who are present here would be uh, reinvigorated to the work of the ministry that you've given us to do towards the preborn. And Lord, we just ask that by Christ Jesus, you would strengthen us to that task. And it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. So again, often when we talk about the issue of, the, of abortion, we use the term image of God. And in fact, I don't think I've ever heard a Christian abolitionist talk about these issues without talk, using that phrase uh, in their speech. But this morning, I want us to see exactly what that means. What does it mean that man was made in the image of God and that even infants and the preborn are in the image of God? So to understand this passage here, this whole psalm, we have to understand the creation of God in the image of man. In Genesis 1 and verse 26 it says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let him ha them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So there was uh, God making man in his image. And notice in our psalm, that is referenced. It says in, uh, in verse 6, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. This psalm is about God getting himself glory in the creation of man in his image. And so what is the image, uh, the, the image of God? What is the, the, this uh, thing that God has given to man to be? Well, we first see that it's not something that is in man himself. It's not something that, that we as creatures are, but rather uh, it is something that God has imposed on on to us. It's his purpose that he's given to us. Man is a fleshly creature. Just like all those animals that it says God has given him dominion over, mankind is also a fleshy kind of creature. In Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 17 says, I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them, and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. 
For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts, even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for that all is vanity. All go unto one place, all are of the dust, and all return to dust again. Man was made uh, j like the beasts of the field, uh, j just like the animals on the earth. As to our constitution, what makes us up, we are no better than they are. And this is why the psalmist even asks in our passage in Psalm 8, verse 3, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy finger, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. He, the, the psalmist looks up at the stars. He sees these things that are made of a purer substance than we are. He considers even the angels and how we, as human beings, are made of the dust of the ground. And so, as to our constitution, we are, we are unworthy of this calling that God has given to us to be his image. And so what is the image of God? Well, the image of God is the function that God gave to man to bear his name, to be in his likeness, to, to, to remind creation, as it were, of the Lord our God. In verse 1 and verse 9, both give us, in our passage, the same refrain. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who hast set thy glory above the heavens. In verse 9, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. These repeated phrases, the end cap, the psalm, give us the purpose of the psalm. And that is for the, the, the glory of God, for his name to be uh, exalted and known throughout all the earth. And so that is what the image of man is. It is the purpose that God gave to man to remind creation about himself. In verse, uh, in verse 1, again, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Uh, to this end, man was made to be like God in some limited, created ways. And he's given responsibility. All of us are given responsibility to imitate God in these limited ways. In Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Man was made to be holy as God is holy because God is to be worshipped. In Ephesians 4 and verse 24, another reference to the image of God. Put on the new man, which after God, or we could say in the image of God, is created in righteousness and true holiness. Uh, the, the image of God that's been put on us to be made after God or like God is for the purpose of holiness, is for the purpose of religious worship to him. Uh, and just as, as the scripture says that God is holy, 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 that, that he is to be praised, man is to be holy unto the praise of God. And this is fulfilled in our religion, in the Christian religion, uh, of us being priests unto our God by Jesus Christ, as Revelation says. In Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. This was the first job that God gave to man, to dress and to keep the garden. And that language, to dress and keep the garden, is used later in the scripture of the priestly office. Uh, about, how, uh, about how Aaron and his sons were to enter into the tabernacle of the congregation, and they were to keep their charge, or they were to guard the, the sanctuary of the Lord. In Numbers 3 and verse 6 through 7, if you'd like to look at that later, they shall keep their charge and the charge of the whole congregation in the tabernacle of the congregation. And this calling still continues until today. God still calls mankind to, to glorify him in the worship of him. In Isaiah 40 and verse 22, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent, or a tabernacle, to dwell 
in. This world that God has made is his tabernacle. It is his sanctuary. And therefore, if a man is in his sanctuary, in his tabernacle, we still have that call and obligation to serve and glorify our God. And to this end, as our passage says, man was given dominion in the creation, was given kingly authority, a kind of created sovereignty over the creation. In verse 6, thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. If we are to order and keep the tabernacle of the Lord, his sanctuary, God has to give us authority to do that. He has to give us the right to go into his tabernacle and to order it for himself. In Genesis 9, 2, it says that the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the field. Uh, this, is, this is that uh, power and authority that God gave to mankind to go in and do these things. And therefore... Because the image of God contains this call to serve God, to be, his, to be his representatives in the world, it gives us worth as his servants. We are not worth anything in ourselves by our own constitution. But because God has called us and equipped us to be his representatives in the world, and again, to remind the world of him, therefore we have dignity and worth. We are God's messengers, and Christ says in Matthew 23, 34, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of ye, them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Notice how Christ says he sent forth his servants into the world to do his will, to be his messengers, and that for this reason, when they shall take them and kill them and treat them ill, that they have judgment heaped onto them, the world does. And so because we are his messengers, we're his representatives, Therefore, again, we have this moral worth. It's also because we are an approved likeness of God. We look something like him among the creation. And in the powers that he's given to us and the things that he's called us to do, we have some likeness in a created way to the Lord our God. And therefore, we also have this worth. In Genesis 9, verse 5, Surely your blood of your lives will I require, and at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. If we are the image and likeness of God, then he that sheds man's blood, he that kills us, does a great sacrilege against God. Uh, if, if we are his likeness and they have killed us because of the likeness of God that's in us, or, therefore they have judgment again. They, they, have, they have effaced an image of the Lord their God. And so this image gives us our worth. Otherwise, we would be no more worth anything than a dog. We, we, wouldn't, be, uh, we wouldn't be any different from a deer or a rabbit, uh, which we know don't have the dignity which man has. And the extent of this image of God that he has sovereignly put on us is to all mankind, to everyone who is after the likeness of God to everyone that is born of woman, this image is upon them. In verse 1 of our passage, again it says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who hast set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Again, this is just a reference to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis 1.27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have 
dominion. There's that, there's that call for mankind to reproduce, for, for, for mankind to have children. It's included in the image of God given to man. And so if, if we are made in the image of God, if, if that is what gives us our dignity and worth, and if the children are here said to be a part of that image, therefore, of course, it's wrong to take a child's life. And, and it's wrong to take an unborn person's life. The blessing of God that he placed on mankind includes all of mankind. As our passage says that he has ordained strength out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. This, this extends even to the children and to, to the preborn as well. They are even in the image of God. In Jeremiah 1 verse 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Notice the exact language that, that the Lord speaks to Jeremiah there. He says, I sanctified thee when thou, before thou was formed in the womb. Uh, but before thou camest forth out of the womb, I ordained thee a prophet. That's that same calling language, that same, that same setting of his image on his servant that he has set on all mankind. Some object to this by saying that man is not the image of God until his first breath, but this is plainly wrong given that passage. God called us, God ordained every human being before he was born in the womb. He had this common calling to be the image of God in the earth. And therefore, it is a great sin to kill the preborn. In Jeremiah 7 and verse 30, I think it's, it's providential that the, Jeremiah begins with God declaring the image of God on the preborn. And then he goes on in Jeremiah 7 verse 30. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, saying, saith the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. God declares that even the preborn, even Jeremiah before he was formed in the womb was in his image. And then he says, Judah has sinned by destroying the image of God in their child, found in their children. Now this, again, is God's sanctuary we, we mentioned a while ago. This world is His temple, His, His holy place, His house. And they have come into His house and killed His entire family and spread their blood on the family portrait. That's how grave a sin abortion is. That, that's, that is why we fight so strongly against this evil. Because this is God's household. This is God's family. That is His image that they have defiled. And so, why are sinners so set on this wickedness? Verse 2 of our passage gives us a hint to that. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. The reason that the wicked love abortion is, of course, because they hate God. And they hate to be reminded of God. Man is sinful. And as sinful, he knows that he's condemned before God. Romans 1.32, it says, They knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in those that do them. They know the judgment of God on them. They, they, they know His moral law. It's written in their hearts. And when they go out and sin, they know His condemnation on them. And therefore, they want to put God as far away from their minds as they can. That's the, that is the first move of sin, is to go and hide away from the Lord our God. To, to not see His face. In Psalm 10 verse 4, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. They will not seek God. They, they despise to seek God. 
But our passage says that specifically children are a reminder of God. That even they're a reminder of his strength. Thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies. Specifically against the enemies of the Lord. The unborn and the the newborn is a reminder of God's power. So the reason they do this is obvious. It's because the preborn are the purest look that we get at the image of God with our eyes. They have not yet gone into personal sin. And God has still ordained them to remind us of Him. The, The image of God is in the unborn, is in the newborn. And so they do not want to look at it. They don't want to be reminded. How many parents have we known have been convicted of sin by the birth of their firstborn? How many have, 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 have turned their lives somewhat, have tried at some reform when they saw their first child come into the world? But more and more today, men and women are running away from this. We see, of course, the men running away from their responsibility as fathers, not even daring to look at their firstborn. And women are running away from this natural means of grace that God has given them by going to the abortionist, by by having them do away with that image of God that is near to them before they see and are convicted. They would rather see their children gone and dead than they would be brought under the law of God. And so, beloved, this morning, we therefore have a duty to protect the preborn. The preborn are God's image And he loves them. He has given them for his purposes in the world. In Psalm 139 verse 15. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret. And curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance. Yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written. Which in continuance were fashioned. When as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me O God. How great is the sum of them. The Lord loves and thinks about the preborn. The the Lord sees the image that he has placed on them and it delights him. And so we ought to love them the same. We ought to be affected for them as God is affected. To be as David, a man after God's own heart. To love that which he loves and despise that which he despises. And this world is God's sanctuary that we live in. And therefore we have a duty as priests to our God, as his image bearers, to fight for its purity. Just as the priests in the time of Moses were called on to purge the sanctuary. Just as Christ, when he was walking on the earth and he saw those buying and selling in the court of the temple, went in and ransacked the place. We ought to be similarly affected for God's sanctuary. To not allow Tophet to be brought in before the presence of the Lord. Isaiah 40 verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And We ought to call for the same. And further believers, as we'll continue to see today, We have a duty to proclaim Christ's salvation in our time. Faith in Him is the only true way to fulfill the call of God to be His image and to purge His sanctuary. In Colossians 1.14, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Christ Jesus is the culmination of the image of God. He was the only one who truly lived up to that name, to that calling. And therefore, we can't do this without Him. We can't can't purge God's sanctuary without His blood. We can't even have our hearts affected for the preborn without Christ Jesus' Spirit working in our hearts. And so, believers, we must not abandon our Christian faith as we pursue this, uh, this noble goal that we have before us. Now, if there's an unbeliever here, this is, of course, good news for you. 
The passage just said, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You know that you have sinned against God. You know that, that, that you have broken the image of God in you. That you've not lived up to his standards. And therefore, since you have effaced his image in yourself, you've brought shame against the name of our Lord. Therefore, you are worthy of his capital punishment. James 3 verse 8 says, But the tongue can no man tame, it is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. When we have slandered our neighbors, when we have spoken ill about them, when we didn't know, uh, when we, we didn't uh, know anything about the situation, when we gossiped, we gossiped against the image of God. When, when we gossiped, we called God a gossiper because we are made in the image of God. And therefore, we are worthy of death. We have, we have blasphemed God's name. But see again that Christ is able to take this sin from you and give you his righteousness. He is able to restore the image of God to a pure state in you and make you whole. Christ died on the cross for sinners. Christ rose again on the third day for our justification. And therefore, by faith in his name, you can be forgiven. You can be brought back into a pure service of the Lord our God. Romans 3.22 speaks even of the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. And therefore, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And again, believers, I pray that as we go forward today, and as we go forward with the ministry God has given to us, uh, that the Lord would help us to, uh, to uh, tackle this task that he's given to us to do, uh, that we would be his image, that we would purify his sanctuary by Christ, and that uh, above all today, we would be affected to pray for the preborn. Let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer together. God, we thank you again for this morning. We thank you for gathering us together. Lord, we thank you that you've made us in your image. Lord, we are not worthy of this calling. We're not worthy to be the guardians of, uh, Lord, your people. But Lord, we thank you that you've given it to us. And we pray that you would strengthen us to the task. Lord, I pray for everyone here that uh, you would help us today to have good fellowship. And Lord, to uh, remember what we're here for. And, uh, Lord, that you would cause all that's set up in this pulpit to sink deep into the ears of your people. And, Lord, that they would, uh, Lord, that they would not be hearers only, but doers of the word that they hear. Lord, we pray that you would help us, uh, that you would protect us in the days ahead. Lord, that you would be with uh, even our uh, elected officials. Uh, Lord, that you would change their hearts by the Holy Ghost and cause them to trust in Christ. Lord, we ask that they would uh, put a stop to this evil. Until that day that you would help us to do your will. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.